Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed. We are back after a two-week break. It's a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm James, and with me is Matt, G'day. who's been in the world of city-sized transport, and fearless editor Mal, Hello, um, all. who's, look, he's going to chip in. Tasmania at this time of year owns a special place in his motoring heart, and uh, we'll tell you why, mm. and we'll update you on this strange world inhabited by the brightest spark in the room in this week's Must Watch. So stay with us. But first of all, we have had some great feedback that we want to share with you. Uh, so much feedback. It's come from comments at carsguide.com.au. That's the email you can use from YouTube and iTunes. So thank you very much. Yeah. First of all, Andrew Satsarinas uh, has said he likes the podcast and thanks us for moving Mal's chair closer to the microphone. I'm doing my best, um, everyone. Also <laughs> interested in Frosty's whereabouts. Uh, oh. So that's interesting. Frosty. <laughs> look, He might be the only bloke. Uh, look, two words. Valtteri Bottas. Um, yeah. If you're looking for what's behind that step up in confidence and performance. Oh, behind the scenes. Yeah, look. I, I, I'm or not is saying, he Valtteri Bottas? It's pretty close to saying? a direct correlation. <laughs> Bathurst, watch out for a, you know, a, a Bottas appearance. Would it be fair to say he seems to have dropped us like a cold pie? Is that a saying? <laughs> mm-hmm. Cold yeah. pie? Right. Well, I think you're mixing your metaphors, but pie. that's all right. Hot pie. Oh. I think, oh. I think someone it's typically has like a face Every like way a you can pie. drop a pie. Anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Has Blake's, anyone seen his face? Blake Swan, who's a regular, um, has enjoyed our Genesis chat. And it, it, we learned that he's actually based in the States and oh, has great. owned a 3.8 litre R-Spec Coupe. Nice. Says there's been a bit of confusion with dealer representation, but claims the Genesis is, quote, unquote, much better than a 3 Series. Uh, simple tech, great driver, manual transmission. So Ooh. thanks for that, Blake. And manual. I suppose all the more reason why it needs to be right when it's when it's done here, if yeah. there's been a bit of confusion in the States. Too right. Uh, Bonnie Babu is back. Oh, Good one, Bonnie. guys. And says, welcome, Jake. Oh. So uh, Jake gets a special shout-out from Bonnie. Thank you. Um, Slammeron, who's actually Brian Streetberger, gave us a five-star review on iTunes and cred for a good try on pronouncing his last name. Oh. So that's pretty that's pretty handy. Thank you very much. Try that means you didn't succeed, James. Yeah, oh, thanks. Keep man. trying. Thanks, I've man. eaten a street burger once before. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. Yeah. Thailand? <laughs> yeah. Um, so David Anderson uh, loves the standard off-road gear and look of the new Jeep Rubicon, but still has some doubts about the brand's reliability, which um, of course is a, a, delicate, a delicate subject. I would imagine he's not alone there. Uh, well, fair enough at that. Resonance says Matt Campbell's new haircut is as fresh as morning yogurt. Well, it's hidden so- today. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is it still fresh? Yeah. No. No, it's stale. Uh, look, Mine's stale too. Tim Pullins thought this was a gardening show. <laughs> uh, tools in the shed, but has discovered us nonetheless and is a fan, is That's a borderline correct. Richard Berry fanboy, in fact. Oh. And further to our limited edition investigation a few weeks back, offers up a pic of his Golf GTI Pirelli. So oh, yes. I think I think it was a Golf Five, mm. um, the GTI Pirelli. So lucky man, that's uh, that's a nice car. So it was. thank you very much to all of those people. That means a lot to know that you're engaged with the conversations we're having. Please keep it coming. It's absolutely brilliant. So Matt, yes, over to you. Yep, you've been in the diminutive world of city-sized transport. Yep, what's been happening? So we decided that we'd get um, four compact hatchbacks at around or under twenty thousand dollars. That's our imaginary budget, yep. um, because that's what a lot of people are willing to spend on a car that will mainly be uh, a run around or a second car, third car, their kids' car, something like that. So the four cars that we had included the three biggest sellers: the Mazda Two in Neo spec, the Toyota Yaris in Ascent spec. Yep. And the Hyundai Accent in sport spec, because there's only one spec of Accent. Righto. Now, this... Ref- why don't they just call it Ascent? Yeah. Uh, accent, sorry. Well, a maybe cent. that's why. Call yeah. it two cents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, they, uh, these three two represent cents. the entry points to each of their ranges. And the fourth car we had, because we basically included it because we knew that it stood a good chance and we think that it represents the most uh, polished and mature we, we offering think it's in the pretty segment. Good thing. Yeah, it's the Volkswagen Polo right. entry level car which is the trend line. So out of those three sellers, mm-hmm. which is actually currently the top? Uh, it chops and changes. Oh, so it? All right. can't so, really yep. say they knuckle yeah. they knuckle it out for yeah. the top spot. Yep. Yeah. Which would we say was our existing benchmark for well, 
being a good car. Well, it's it's so hard to say which is the the benchmark in that segment because there are so many players. Like we're yeah. talking fifteen or twenty different hatchbacks at around the same sort of money. Um, so it's really hard to pick one, and that's why we took. For. I mean, there are cars there that we didn't include, like a Suzuki Swift, for yep. example. Yep. There's no Ford Fiesta anymore, so um, there's there's a few cars that could have been included, but we didn't because Aston we Aston Martin Signet. True. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Volkswagen. Sadly. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the the three cars, the three big sellers versus the one that we think probably is the best, and we wanted to figure out whether you should be spending extra to get the best car, yeah. which is the Volkswagen, uh, or whether the cheaper models manage to hit the points that they should. Because the Volkswagen didn't quite come under 20, did it? No, it's 21,390 or something, um, but at the moment at 21 and a half drive away, so for the automatic. Yeah, because yeah. the, the other on-road, yeah. uh, sorry, MSRPs, yeah. it's under 20. Other, yeah. What I was going to say was the other thought there is that by the time you get to that money, mm. you're almost taking a step up to the next size Kind exactly. of category, if you like. Exactly, and I think that's one of the Polo's biggest problems is that it is overpriced in that segment. Uh, the base model manual you can get for under twenty thousand dollars drive away, um, but the automatic adds a two and a half grand premium. The usual. Um, so most of the other cars in the segment will have at least one version under twenty grand drive away, and some of them have two or three versions under twenty grand drive away. And it's all not as obvious as you might think, because like you know, the Yaris is pretty old, mm-hmm. the Accent's pretty old, but oh, yeah. the you know the recently added option packs to the Accent that uh, sorry the um not the Accent the uh, Yaris yeah, sorry the Ascent the, I know I got the, confused the too Yaris so. Ascent <laughs> yeah. I get confused uh, that punches it right up to the. You know exactly present day, and it has the safety stuff. Um, mm. I mean, there were a few uh, glaring emissions in terms of city cars because um, the Hyundai doesn't have AEB. Uh, it also doesn't have a rear view camera or reversing camera. It also doesn't have parking sensors. Wow! So you're parking that's a miss by for a touch, city car, isn't it? Uh, yeah. a lot of times. Well, it's audible, uh, t- you yeah. know, but it's not the normal sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's more of a crunch than a beep. Yeah, um, that's right. Whoever's behind you also hears the, yeah. the audio. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> but I mean, these four cars all have different levels of safety equipment and different times when they were crash tested. As we come back to every time that we talk about NCAP, you sort of go, well, if it's got five stars from five or seven years ago, is that good enough? Would you recommend it? And a lot of the time we go to ourselves, well, ooh, yes, I don't know. Like That's been tightened up somewhat mm. in that from, as I understand it from here on in, there's going to be a two-year kind of window or, or I'm not sure whether you guys know more about that. I can't anyway. remember the duration, but I think they'll expire. They'll expire. That's so the they bloody should. And uh, the, the other variable here, when you're a company designing one of these cars, the stats bear out that these are typically first new car purchase yep. for younger people yep. and last new car exactly. purchase for older people. So you're trying to cater to two quite dramatically different uh, audiences yeah. uh, with the one car. Exactly. And, you know, you also might think, oh, I'm only driving around the city, so, you know, average speed of about 40 k's max. You can still do a lot of damage at 40 k's Sure, an hour. Yep. absolutely. And That's fast. truck drives into you, it's still going to really hurt. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. safety is critical, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Can't be ignored. Exactly. And um, also critical uh, in, in the city car segment is fuel use. Mm. Um, and we were absolutely blown away by how bad some of these cars were on petrol. Um, we're talking, we, we focused on city driving because that's the focus of the test was yep. city driving. And we got uh, about 10 to 10 and a half litres for the, the Mazda, the Volkswagen and the uh, Toyota. Uh, but the, Yara, uh, sorry, the Accent was using nearly 14 litres per hundred. Wow. Mm. And this is just, you know. That's heaps. It's terrible. Like, yeah. You know, I, I, I've driven mid-size SUVs or large SUVs that yeah. use about the same amount of fuel around town, which... I'm getting close to that in similar circumstances with the Mazda CX-9, yeah. which is also petrol, which, but weighs two tonnes. Yeah, it beggars belief how, how they could be so inefficient. Yes. Um, but, was I mean, one person driving the Hyundai more than, you know, no, the other cars? No, this was, oh, wow. it was standardised. Was and it a tame racing driver? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're asking. Yeah. Yeah. No. Mm. So it, it, um, it was a bit... tested by the name of Yulden or <laughs> <laughs> it was Richards bit... or someone along on the test? No, but a bit strange that the, they were so poor on fuel consumption. Um, there were some differences in terms of driving comfort and so on. I mean, you have to read the review and watch the video and... 
hear what I have to say. Uh, and that was based on not just my opinion. We also had three uh, potential customers in the uh, in the test that yep. um, three of our junior staff that would be in that you know first brand new car market. Um, and they, I mean. Did they offer up was, insights that you wouldn't have necessarily yeah. been focusing on? Yeah, yeah I mean, good. that's great. All three found the Hyundai to be quite confidence-inspiring to drive. Where my critical mind was saying, "Well, I don't like the way the steering does this, and I don't like the ride because it's too firm." Yep. And we know but, it's old. We know the styling's a generation old. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting but to see that with fresh eyes. Call, isn't it? And that's a good. lot of lot of comments from um, just people as we were doing the shoot. Oh, I love that blue on the Hyundai. So huh. that could be enough to get someone across the line. Exactly. And at 17 grand drive away or whatever it is. Yep. As I've said before, we once bought, my partner and I bought a brand new Golf mm-hmm. um, on the basis of the instruments illuminating blue at night. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So forget about ride, forget about fuel economy, safety. It was like, we're going to have that one. Yeah. Because the lights, the, the dials blue. light up blue at night. Yeah. yeah. And exactly. That, that's another example of why we love to get the comments. Yes. Yeah. We can't. Absolutely. We do not profess to think of everything. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we love when people bring uh, a different approach. All yeah. right. Well, I think with that, we'll we'll move on. And mm-hmm. um, to the point where Mal and I were having a discussion uh, during the week, because I've been fortunate enough to be on the Targa tour this week. It's Targa time down in Tasmania. Too many T's. But anyway. Um, we're, <laughs> it's, it's still on today. It's still on tar- Targa tour today is still a thing, but that's not just me. Anyway. <laughs> so wrap up. Um, it's Friday afternoon. Saturday. 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 So Tomorrow. For those that don't know, so it is still um, going. most go. listeners and viewers will. It's a tarmac <laughs> rally where the competitive classes are pretty well flat out. It's just like a rally except on a made road surface. World renowned. Absolutely. And, and um, based on the Targa Florio and uh, Milia Mia in mm-hmm. Italy, uh, that sort of formula. And a companion event is called the Targa Tour. And that's for people who want to take their car and follow those same stages, have a crack at them, but they're limited in terms of top speed and some of the restrictions in terms of, or requirements are, are a little looser. And yeah, no need for a roll cage or helmets road cage or, or helmets harnesses. Or, yeah, so I've, I've been doing that for three days during this week. First timer. And it is just such a delicious feeling to be able to have a good speed on a public road. Not that I've ever done that before. It, it was really extraordinary to, <laughs> to, to experience that for the first know. time. <laughs> but um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the stages on day one was actually Georgetown you know, oh, yeah. in Tasmania. And it's a city stage, like a town stage. Yeah. So there you are rip-roaring around the town, just like you've always dreamed of. Like, Using both it, sides of the road. Absolutely. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great through to just fang suburbia. through town <laughs> and kind of hook into that corner and then go around Mrs. Granger's place and then... But we did it. It yeah. was absolutely huge fun. And like any rally, there are some fairly long transports between the actual closed stages. But yeah, once you're on there, like Mal says, you're using the whole road, just pretending you're on this ribbon of racetrack, mm. but out um, in the bush. And Tasmania, thanks... You know, Tassie Hydro and the logging industry down there for, for producing these roads because yeah. they follow the contours of the hills and mountains, dip, dive, curve, twist. They've made these great driving roads and people come from all over the place and bring their cars and just have a ball for the week. It's really great. And so I did it in 2016 mm-hmm. uh, yep. in, under similar circumstances and I think we pretty much did the same routes. But okay, the big takeaway, aside from you know, having the time of my life, was oh. that I saw parts of Tassie that I'd never yeah. never knew existed, yeah. and roads that I would never have found as a tourist. Yeah, look, uh, northwestern Tasmania is also beard central. Saw some spectacular ZZ <laughs> stop, uh, uh, top style beards, and look the way the way Tasmania embraces this event, it was really amazing. Um, the person I was co-driving with, she pretty quickly said, oh, get used to people waving and being on the side of the road. It's beautiful, And isn't all of it? a sudden, you've, you know what Kim Kardashian feels like. There's people <laughs> putting cameras your way and waving. I was doing yeah. a kind of royal queen wave for a <laughs> while. give them a toot? It was lovely. You toot the it's, horn, rev the engine or whatever. beautiful the way the locals embrace Kid, a motorsport event. Yeah. Kids driving, on, on the Blocking fence. their street. Yeah. Kid, kids at school yeah. on the fence, kind of watching everything. I mean, going early up. in the morning, kids in their pajamas. It's yeah. unreal. Just pa- beautiful. Parts of Tasmania don't see much in the way of traffic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there were news crews from or the local fair, newspapers man. there to yeah, just cover the fact that that was all on. Yeah. yeah was, <laughs> things were happening in town. It's for a big once. event, but I mean, people approach it in their own way and get something out of it, whether they're in the competitive part and they really get their race face on and want to do a time and mm-hmm. win their segment or whatever. 
uh, the tour participants uh, have a car that they like and it's just an opportunity for them to have a red hot go yeah. um, on a public road. And like you, you're limited to 130 kilometres an hour top speed. We're, we're 120 this time around. 120. 120, okay. Yep. Oh, yep. Things have changed. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yep. the thing is, for a lot of these stages, it's pretty hard to get to 120. It is. Yeah. You're twisting so hard that 120 seems stratospheric. There's yeah. no way you're getting close to it. Mind you, there were people driving, you know, a particular Italian car, might have been red. and With a and, horse? Uh, <coughs> some kind of horse. Yeah, right. Um, they were driving it with a horse. And yeah. That's like dancing horses? Well, they may as well have been because midway d- through day one, out, gone, toughed oh. out because <laughs> between closed stages, they'd had a bit of a speed, like a big speed. All right. And you've got a race safe uh, device on the dash, which will, it's like Big Brother in mm-hmm. the car, will go back to race control and will show at any given point where you are, what speed you're doing. So Oof. it is clear as crystal if you're breaking the rules and they are pretty hard and fast on it, pardon the pun. But so these people went big speed Oof. really quickly, ignored all that. Well, you're out. And you're back on the boat to the mainland. Oh, boy. And some people had a bad day where they departed the black surface and oh. joined in nature. Oh, um, that no. happened as well. So you've got to watch yourself, but the it was, it the was great. The other great thing is you don't need to have a, a co-driver calling pace notes. Mm. And in, unless you've got a really good co-driver who's skilled at not confusing left and right, it's probably better not to have yeah. one. <laughs> that's, right. <laughs> that's right. But anyway. we, we both have the benefit of having professional co-drivers, sure. which is another thrilling and experience. once their voice starts up, it's like... This sense of security and safety that they have this magical authority in their voice, the way they're making the calls, you go, oh wow, they mm. really know what they're doing, and it so helps. But, <laughs> and once you get into a rhythm, it's an incredible yeah, teamwork, isn't great. it? You really get. Yeah, you're rallying. so right, Mal. The sense of co-driver mm. um, takes on a whole new significance. So we're going to have um, some words and a video and pics of all of that. So cool. look out for that uh, coming up very shortly. And hopefully, we've just seen it in the background too. Yeah, you'll see some of that in the background. Um, I, you know, some of my best camera work, really, getting the <laughs> getting the GoPro on various various parts of the car. If I do say so. So, so myself. So now <laughs> we will move on to um, what's in the garage, and I'll kick it off because I want to talk about the car that I drove on oh, yeah. the Target Tour, good, Fair which was the i30 yes. Fastback N. So it's the longer, slightly twelve kilo or something heavier. Yeah, um, is that all? Version? Yeah, wow. it's not. It's not much. It's a decent bit of extra rear overhang. Mm. Two liter wow. turbo, a bit over two hundred kilowatts, um, about three fifty newton meters, I think. Six yeah. speed manual. Great we were, diff. We were in driving the front. slippery uh, electronic diff up the front. Pirelli P zeros, and tell you what, that car puts its power down so well. You're on those twisty, sometimes damp. If you really want to abuse it, you can get the car to, to kind of spin its wheels, but you've got to be doing silly things yeah. to get it to do that. Normally, you just squeeze that throttle even pretty rapidly and it just goes fantastic, really stable. And allegedly, that weight increase moves the front rear balance a little bit more to the rear. Didn't seem to upset things at all. Yep. Probably just enhanced it. The clutch, the gear change, and the onboard systems to tune up the suspension yeah. and the exhaust and whatever. You've got the little penny bungers being thrown out the back when you want the exhaust on yeah. Sport Plus, which is heaps of fun. Nice, so oh, good. You know? Um, so it really impressed me. Now, it, it's not a cheap car. It's mm-hmm. in the low 40s. By the time you put it on the road, it's it'll be relatively a, cheap. A mid 40s car. It's cheaper than a Golf GTI. Mm. Um, but it's manual and front wheel drive only. That's right. So. Look, we've heard whispers what that shame an all-wheel drive version is probably in the offing. You can read about that on, on Cars Guide. And there's the definitely bank. a dual-clutch auto coming. Coming. Yeah. So, so that'll, yeah, that'll change the game for that it. car. But I think the nature of the Targa Tour was that it actually combined two distinctly different types of driving. Yep. In that on these transports between the closed stage, it's just like touring. You, yeah. know, you could have been with the family out on a... you absolutely respecting the speed limits and, and all of that. Yep. Super comfortable. In comfort mode. Very civilised dial everything up and tweak it up to the sport modes and it does change character and I thought it was fabulous. It Dif- really, I, I thought it was a great car. Different That's- animal, yeah. I, I went, sorry, I just went to the, I went to the launch of the car yep. a few months ago and uh, drove it at um, the Bend Motorsport Park yep. in South Australia and I was blown away that I drove it for probably 30 laps and I was like, yeah, I've had enough now. Like, mm. But... Brakes were brakes were good. Brakes were pretty good. Yeah, yeah, good brakes too. And you would have worked those brakes real hard. Very hard. Yeah. And Hyundai's backing up too. Mm. Oh, you bet. They they will warrant it for track use. Yeah. As long yeah. as it's not competitive. Yeah. That's such a that's such an important point. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. Well, that's that's me done. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Matt, 
You have been overseas. I've been on another island. Not yeah. a typical driving destination. No. But Phil, Which one was this? I can't even remember. This was uh, this was Fiji. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hula. Hula. And for my uh, week in between uh, Easter and Anzac Day, that whole period, uh, my partner and I decided that we'd head out to Fiji for a week. And uh, I had very, very excitedly booked a Suzuki Jimny as my uh, yes. hire car it's for the week. One? Pardon? The new one? No. Oh. No. The existing one. Uh, Jimny Manual. That was my preference. Yep. That's what I'd booked. And when we rocked up, they said, oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Campbell. We don't have that car. We've got an upgrade for you. And I've gone, oh, I know this part. upgrade. Yeah. This should be good. And like I've looked at their little uh, sheet showing what, you what, was what next options. Step up? Next step up was um, a Suzuki Vitara. And I was like, okay. right Righto. Um, not sure whether that's a huge upgrade, but, um, then they put you in an M5 and then above that, there's things like <laughs> a, um, uh, Suzuki S cross. And then there's like a Land Rover discovery. 4. Wow. But they put me in mm. a Mazda BT 50 dual cab, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and not the current generation version. <laughs> wow. Wow. Pre 2011. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. Mm. That is an upgrade. At face, it's an old high car. At the, uh, it it may have been a newer car than 2011, but uh, you know they sometimes car Continue companies keep building old keep cars developing for markets. developing markets. Now okay. this was a developing market special because it had wow. no airbags. <gasps> wow. It had no stability control. Heater. It had a heater and air conditioning. Okay. It had power steering. Um, so it was wow. um, agricultural. Wow. But I will say this: the ride. With nothing in the tray was better than the vast majority of Utes today. Wow! How I was many really Ks? Shocked. How many Ks are on the Seventy-five thousand. Is that all? Yeah. Did you do a load wow. test? Didn't. No. Actually, <laughs> okay. I lie. We did do a load test. <laughs> what did you put in? We there? went to a beach and at uh, after sand. sand. <laughs> after after swimming for a couple of hours, um, we were approached by some locals saying, "Oh, hey, we we need to get out. Would oh. you would you mind if we jump in the tray and?" Go up the road. I'm like, yep. Cool. So I had four of uh, Fiji's biggest, friendliest locals <laughs> in the back. Awesome. Did you ever sing along? Uh, no, they were cackling like it was the best thing that's ever happened to them. So cool. it was, it was a, it was a great thing. But the thing about driving in Fiji, uh, you've got to be prepared for the worst because you can right. be the maximum speed limits 80 k's an hour. Um, most people stick to that uh, because. You can be going along at 80 k's an hour and without warning, there will be a foot high speed hump or a two foot deep pothole. Oh, yeah. Right. So, That's good. Um, the ruggedness of my Mazda hire car came into good effect. This there. is probably a whole other podcast, but I, I think my worst driving environment I've ever been in, and I must say I've been in a few, is Crete and a oh, yeah? Sayat Marbella. Marbella. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. So, Was that the Fiat? Panda. Yeah, yeah, Panda wow. A wow, solid axle, front wheel drive. Yeah, trucks Ooh, having the a... car, the Falcon of Italy. Anyway, we'll talk about that another time. We'll Let's do a that, special we'll, edition we'll of that away. Worst, yes, driving worst driving roads. experiences. Yeah, I do Let's remember do lots of specials. Fiji, yeah. uh, the fam, we went to Fiji a couple of years ago. The Bula bus. Ah, uh, yes, Bula bus, <laughs> which has the thatched uh, hut style roof. Yeah, and it was a bit cheeky because. There were Bula buses up to 10, but we only ever saw the higher numbers. Oh. I'm not sure the fleet was actually that large. There may have been some fudging on the numbers. Right. It's a cunning marketer behind Coming the, the <laughs> Bula bus. Anyway, all right. So, Mal, moving on to your good self. Yes. You've been um, also experiencing an interesting kind of vehicle and combination. Yeah, racking up the Ks Yep. in a Tesla Model X, which is yep. nothing new. But this time, we had a caravan on the back. Yes. Ooh. Which... Caravan, electric vehicle. Hmm. Doesn't, does, it's not a natural fit at this point, is it? It would not seem to be, yep. given, uh, I think my intro says it's fair to say that uh, distance between charges and uh, the reliability of um, charge estimates are probably the two biggest issues facing uh, electric cars at this stage. Whack 1.7 tonnes of caravan on the, on the back. back. Yeah. What happens? Yep. Mm. So um, we had the thanks, thanks to our good friends at Tesla, who uh, clearly are fans of our weekly bulletin oh. we uh, yeah, yeah. put on the podcast. Yes. Yeah, boss. Yep. Uh, they uh, set us up with a, I mean, all Model Xs come with a tow bar tucked in beneath the rear bumper. Um, but uh, the, uh, yeah, anyway, we teed up uh, the loan of the Model X with a Avida caravan, thanks to our friends at Avida. And for a palate cleanser and a sort of a, 
in chemistry terms, uh, is it a, a known? I thought you were doing a load a control well. we for a control. Yeah, no, 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 no. A control. We had an eight, uh, 200 series Land Cruiser along for the cool. test as well. Great. Are you going to say thanks to our friends at Toyota for that? <laughs> thanks to our friends. Are you going to say, gonna say thanks to your friends? Do I sound like Tony Gregg today or what? <laughs> what about these friends? Got thanks to my friends in the test. room. Thanks All the Mr. friends Pritchard. that came on the yeah. test, it was uh, it was good to have you. Thanks. And thanks to <laughs> thanks Super to Crafty Auto in and Penrith. Jake and Tom and Josh, who also joined us for the <laughs> test. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, about the test. We drove it over the Blue Mountains twice, <laughs> uh, unladen, both vehicles laden and unladen, and had some very interesting results. Um, the Land Cruiser, probably the, the, the most telling results were that... Uh, on the return leg from Bathurst to Penrith, so via the Bells Liner Road, adding the caravan to the back of the Model X increased its energy consumption by 101%. Oh, no, sorry, 112%, I think it was. Right. Uh, so would that be the equivalent so of So doubled like, the fuel usage. Would that yeah. be like pinning the throttle? You know, if you, if you didn't have your caravan on, would be the equivalent of, of hard acceleration, do you reckon? It's a bit hard to test that on the Bells yeah, but, Line with uh, all the speed limits. But that's the thought that comes to my mind, that hooking a caravan on the back, yeah, it's got to be a massive drain. Yeah, on, well, on it, the it was doubling its energy use. Yeah, and, how um, did, and the performance was still... The performance was outstanding standing. still. Okay. So yeah. if you don't like travelling slowly with a caravan, get a Model X. Well, yeah, <laughs> right. uh, but also the stability of it was exemplary compared okay. to the Land Cruiser, which is, you know... One of our favourite tow vehicles. Much lower centre of ba- gravity. Battery, yeah. Batteries, More on, aero, batteries on the floor helping yeah. that, yeah. but a, a road focused suspension setup as well. Yep. And having a lot of mass uh, yep. really helped. Yep. Great brakes. Um, but the cruiser on that same leg only uh, increased its fuel consumption by 66%. So right. still a fair big, big difference. That's a 1.746 tonne caravan. Um, cruiser's rated to carry a lot more. The Model X is rated to carry 2.25 tonnes. Um, yep. But still uh, illustrative of what happens when you put something on because the Because it really magnifies that whole issue around recharging, doesn't it? Because the very nature of putting a caravan on the back means you're touring, you're going on holidays. Yeah. So if yep. you're using that energy more quickly, the access to a fast charger is all the more critical. Yeah. Right? And we chose the route to be uh, you know, between a destination charger and a fast charger anyway. Yeah. Um, but um, with the other, another way of telling the story is that with the caravan attached, the Tesla made it from Penrith to Bathurst with just 12% uh, remaining. And just charge. roughly for people out of state, what would that distance be, Mel? Do you reckon? 68 kilometres. 68. The there dash. you go. No, or no. The total distance between Penrith and... Oh, 162 yeah. kilometres. 162. Sorry. Yeah. And look, um, I think it's a it's a, it's told a very interesting story. You should have a read at carsguide.com.au or yeah. check out the video on YouTube. Mm. Now, a lot of commenters have come out saying, why don't we compare the costs of the energy consumed? Um Fair point, but if you have a look at the story, it's full of numbers, and we had to draw the line somewhere, particularly mm-hmm. in the video, which, you know, if you do a video that's just right. like reading a barcode the whole time, no one will listen. Yes. Um, but calculating relative costs isn't as easy as you think. It's uh, They're both sort of uh, sort of relates to two different scales of, of cost and two different sources of energy. And so also depends when you bought your... Tesla, whether you got supercharging included yeah, as right. part of the purchase, yep. yes. Yep. whether you've got to pay for the subscription or whatever they're doing with it now, it changes every few That's months. That's a factor totally. with lower uh, totally. models, is it not? Yeah. That supercharging isn't a given. I think so, yeah. yeah. And also the fact that you don't have to charge your Tesla at a Tesla supercharger. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's the destination charger, but also um, the NRMA uh, fast chargers that are popping up around the place um, as well. They're currently free. Mm. Um and ChargeFox is uh, going to be linking uh, Brisbane and Adelaide by the end of the year, aren't they? Yeah, so that's the rumour. All right. It's it's hard to sort of compare like with like, whereas you can get diesel everywhere and the price is pretty consistent, Yeah, uh, yeah. thankfully. Uh, but anyway, have a look. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, um, speaking of interesting, what a week <laughs> it has been because it is time for Musk Watch. <laughs> Great. Okay. Look, where to start? Um, okay, I've got a place to start. Robo taxis. Um, look, we picked up a story. Um, we, the Sydney Morning Herald uh, says that there, we knew that there was a Tesla Autonomy Day. That's what it was called. Yeah. But CEO Elon Musk expects to start converting the company's electric cars into fully self-driving vehicles next year. That's right. Next year, 2020 as part of an audacious plan to create a network of robotic taxis to compete against Uber, 
and other ride hailing services. Now, that number is 1 million robo taxis by 2020. Okay? Right. Just let that sink in for a sec. Tesla has built its own quote unquote neural network chip, and that's the big step towards creating robo taxis. So, it's the first time that Tesla's made a chip. And Elon believes it's the best that's ever been made. So that's the that's the bridge between here and that. I would mm, say chips. quite audacious plan. Huh. Um, I would say quite ridiculous. He has said it is fundamentally insane to buy anything other than a Tesla. Well, he's right? a psychologist too. He would the, say that. Good. The, pur- the purchasing a vehicle from any other automaker would be like getting a horse. Hmm. Right. So that's some confidence. people really like horses. That's confidence. <laughs> Moving on, we remember that there was a bit of a fracas between the Securities Commission in the States yep. and Elon about Twitter habits. Well, they've gone back. They had to get their serious pants on, I think the judge or magistrate said, which was quite funny. And they have done that and come back. And there are nine points that Elon Musk must respect in terms of his tweeting habits. So CNN Business reports Elon now has a specific set of rules to follow regarding what he can and cannot tweet about without first getting permis- uh, permission from a company lawyer. All right, so it's embarrassing. I thought we had you're this basically before going, all this, You've got to go to a grown-up, right? Mm. So it's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, Tesla or Elon didn't pick up any fines, and it's probably a win for te- uh, Tesla's stability, you've got yeah. to say. Mm. So the first one is he can't tweet about the company's financial condition, statements or results, including earnings or guidance. So the whole April one, oh, Tesla's gone bankrupt, you know, yeah. kind of thing. He can't do that anymore. Um, potential or proposed mergers, acquisitions, dispositions, tender efforts, or offers or joint ventures. So the whole taking Tesla private thing. Can't do that. Production numbers, sales or delivery numbers, blah, blah, blah. So that's Tesla made zero cars in 2011, but will make around 500K in 2019. That thing that went wrong just recently, that would have been checked. So it's... The common sense is essentially the general... We're only up to number four. Yeah. Like, it's basically everything. Yeah. Um, New or proposed business lines that are unrelated to the then existing business lines presently included, uh, you know, vehicle transportation, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, he often gets ideas pitched up on on Twitter. He says, oh, good idea. We'll do that. We'll do that. Yeah. Can't do that. So, there's an example here. Maybe interesting to work with Daimler Mercedes on an electric sprinter. That's a great van. We will inquire. So yeah, right. that kind of stuff. You can't do that anymore. Projection, forecast, or estimate numbers. So that's around, you know, just telling it where it's going to be in yep. terms of dollars, production, all of that stuff. That's got to be referred to legal counsel now. Uh, non-public legal or regu- regulatory filings or decisions. Um, then you go to any event requiring the filing of a Form 8K by the company. So that's a bit of a coverall. Uh for corporate news that doesn't fit into the other more specific categories. So that's like a blanket thrown over the top now. Right. We've told you specifically about this, but basically anything else. And then under the agreement, Tesla's board can also determine any other topics for which Musk must, must get prior approval before tweeting. So they've still got a backstop now to stop him. What's the or else? Yeah. Uh, I'd say it would be fines. And if he were to transgress... A third time, I think the court would probably lose patience. It's a pretty blatant uh, transgression this yeah, time. Yeah, so it was, but I think that's what they don't want to do. Mm. But if he persists, he's been given sort of two warnings, as it mm. were. Uh, third strike, you're out, I'd imagine. And out of could, Twitter? Out of Twitter, <laughs> out of the company. I, I dare say he'd be uh, taken out of the CEO role. There I can could imagine be, Twitter would be pretty reluctant. To yeah, do big that. fines, yeah. jail time, who knows? You know, because now wow. it's, it's getting serious. So, But it's all there laid out very clearly. Um, in other news, we'll just catch up on quickly. Uh, Citigroup and Goldman Sachs are underwriting Tesla's new effort to raise $2 billion in new funds. Um, Elon claims self-driving systems in development now will turn Tesla into a business with a half a trillion dollar, that's $500 billion market cap. Current capitalization is $42 billion. So there's a bold claim. That was at an investor call. Uh, Tesla He's turned, doing that we're becoming a mobility company too. Yeah. Tesla made a $700 million loss in Q1 this year. So... There's all the fanfare, there's reality. Yeah. Uh, another $700 million Q1 loss. And sadly, SpaceX, the Crew Dragon, uh, there was a fail on the launch pad. Twitter silence on that. Uh, no, uh, no real news on that. So yeah, surprise. Major explosion. As we're talking, you'll see a bit of that uh, flame and carnage in right. the background. Didn't, mm. didn't go well. Uh, 
The Model 3 production tracker from Bloomberg, we're at 5992. So it's giving that Magic 6000 a big nudge. Good. It's only taken a year or so longer than was uh, initially predicted. Share price has steadily dropped to $244. So the funding mm. secured tweet was him positioning it at 420 um, remember? So yeah. we're now at 244 That's there not nice. There is some desertion of, of that stock. So the short sellers are going to be loving that. Mm. And um, Elon will be annoyed. Hey, why doesn't anyone ever talk about the fact that, yeah, he he has done this great thing for electric cars and uh, that's a good green move. Yeah. But sending things up to space. Maybe m- not. Maybe not. Yeah. Is he offsetting? Boring holes in the... Um, in the Probably not. I don't. Th- I don't imagine he's doing that with green energy. Flamethrowers. Think of the CO two. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, Once he sorry. gets that up to scale, the bigger flamethrowers, mm. they're probably coming down the pipeline. Mm. Oh. They're made with green energy. Anyway, look. Tell us what you think of the new leader. We'd, we'd love to to get your thoughts on yeah. all of that. Are you buying into it? Are you on board? I know Richard Berry is, which is uh, a worry Ooh. in itself. Is but uh, or are you maybe casting a more sceptical eye on some of these enthusiastic claims? Let us know. Okay. With that. We've reached the finish line. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. And thank you, Mal. Thank you, James. And thanks and to Matt. our producer, Mr. Pritchard. Sterling effort, as always. See you, awake. You can join the conversation by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us, as I said before, at comments at carsguide.com.au. Let us know what we've done well, maybe not so well. If we don't know, we can't fix it. Please let us know. Yeah. You can listen to and watch us on YouTube or jump into the comments with our regulars and voice your opinion. If you're enjoying Tools in the Shed, please let other people know and please rate and review us on iTunes because it helps other people find the podcast. Till next week, why would you smear peanut butter on the road? To go with the traffic jam. Oh. I know, that is awful. Sorry. Thanks to all Mel's friends. I'll see myself out. (laughs) Well, I'm